Good morning. Welcome to CMT Markets on Friday, the 21st of October. And this quick look at the week ahead, beginning the 24th of October. Uh, it's, it's, it's really been quite a week. I mean, um, UK politics um, continues to drive market volatility, um, particularly, in, particularly in terms of the value of the pound, gilt markets as well. Um, China slowdown. There was a whole raft of Chinese economic data that was due to be released earlier this week, which has now been delayed and we don't know until when. Um, the reasons for that are not known, but ultimately I can't imagine that it's because the data is any good. Um, China has said that it's prepared to relax some of its inward bound quarantine measures, but it's hard to see what difference that will make to um, the slowdown or the performance in the Chinese economy over the course of the next few months. You know, and I think this is this has really been the key here. Um, Fed officials have been very, very vocal in calling for much higher rates. We've seen mixed earnings. I think we can safely say that the earnings outlook has been fairly weak. Tesla obviously disappointed. And we're coming on to a very, very big couple of weeks for um, global markets. Um, US 10-year Treasury yields are above 4.2%, the highest levels since 2007. We can see that. We can we can see that in this 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 graph here, which I'm about to show you. And they've they've pretty much gone parabolic over the course of the last few months. If we look at, say, for example, UK gilt yields again, um, this is the 30-year back above 4% after a brief dip uh, yesterday on Thursday on uh, the announcement that Liz Truss is stepping down as Prime Minister. If we look at the 10-year, again, we can see a similar uplift today, up 12 basis points after some really awful um, retail sales numbers for September, minus 1.6% coming on top of the big declines that we saw um, in August is not looking particularly pretty for the UK economy. Nonetheless, we can at least console ourselves with the fact that borrowing costs are lower than they were um, two to three weeks ago when that mini budget was released. So we are now on the cusp of another leadership contest um, from this dumpster fire of a government. Um, so the big question is who's going to take over? Um, you know, there's been reports, as I record this video, that Boris Johnson could be preparing to make a comeback. Rishi Sunak obviously is in the frame. The 1922 committee have changed the rules, are changing the rules to make sure that this time the process for electing a leader, new prime minister, is speedier. And hopefully we may know by Monday, but certainly we'll know by Friday at the latest, Friday the 28th ahead of the mini budget on the 31st of October, a lot of which has already been trailed by the new Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, who is not standing in the leadership contest. So it looks quite likely that we could have a new Prime Minister um, by Monday, but certainly by the 28th of October. Who that is, is anybody's guess. But what I would say is that while there was an initial relief rally in the pound on the back of Liz Truss stepping down, it's really hard to see anything tangibly positive for the pound, um, whoever takes over. The Conservative Party in its current form is so riven by partisanship that anyone who takes over, even if it's Rishi Sunak, even if it's Boris Johnson, whoever, um, there will always be those working in the background to undermine the leader. You know, and I think that is the real biggest problem going forward. Um, we need a unity of policy with any government, whether it be Conservative or Labour. There are some who are calling for a general election, but let's let's just remember that if a general election is called, it's probably unlikely to happen much before December. Um, so you're going to get another two or three months of uncertainty. So you've really got to weigh up whether you want another two or three months of uncertainty or whether 
the Conservatives can get their act together, and that's going to be a big ask, get their fiscal act together and actually reassure the markets. The good news is at least UK gilt yields are back below US Treasury yields. But certainly, I think in terms of the outlook going forward, we've got European Central Bank meeting coming up um, in the coming week. We've got the Bank of Canada. We've got the Bank of Japan. Um, obviously, that's a big meeting because of dollar yen at 150. And then that's followed the week after by the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England, who have to sort of try and make economic forecasts based on this train wreck of um, governance, if you like. So um, let's start for the here and now. We've got the ECB coming up in the coming week. We've got the Bank of Japan. We've got the Bank of Canada. We've got US third quarter GDP. Um, we also have, uh, it's a big week for earnings. We've got a big week for UK banks. And obviously UK banks this week took a little bit of a hit on reports that um, the any new government, new administration could be looking at a windfall tax on UK bank profits. Now, I mean, there's many reasons to criticise um, banks here in the UK, notwithstanding the measly returns that you get on your savings. Maybe that's something that um, politicians could start talking to the banks about, because when you look at lending rates and two-year mortgage, you know, two-year two fixed mortgage rates at six percent and ISA rates of 0.7, you know, there is a little bit of a mismatch there. So, I, you know, I certainly think there is scope for the banks and maybe for the banks to certainly, I think, return more of their profits to their customers in terms of higher returns on their cash deposits. Nonetheless, we've got HSBC on the 25th of October, we've got Barclays on the 26th of October, we've got Lloyds on the 27th of October, and we've got NatWest on the 28th. Let's not also forget that um, banks currently pay the headline corporation tax rate plus an 8% levy, bank levy on top of that. So from next year, they will be paying an effective tax rate of 33%. And ultimately, you really do want the banks to try and continue to lend to the real economy, even if as things get more and more difficult. And obviously, if interest rates continue to go up, they're going to have to make larger provisions for non-performing loans, as we've seen in recent US bank earnings. So there is that to consider. Um, we've also got third quarter earnings from Shell. Um, talk of an additional windfall tax on top of the 65% real tax rate that the big oil companies pay on their UK earnings. And, you know, and again, you've got the UK government tendering oil and gas licenses for the North Sea. So you want the oil companies to basically drill for more natural gas while at the same time looking to increase the corporation tax rate from or the actual effective tax rate from the current 65 percent. Not really sure how that's going to work. So certainly raising tax rates or keeping the Rishi Sunak inspired raising of corporation tax rate has reassured markets. But ultimately, at what cost to the UK economy heading into 2023? I'm not really sure that raising taxes, particularly on business, is the right way to um, deal with this particular crisis. But unfortunately, the UK's fiscal credibility with the markets is currently so shot to pieces that perhaps another three or, in, in three or four months' time of responsible stewardship of the economy may allow a tempering of that, those raising of tax rates as we head towards the next fiscal year. For the here and now, sentiment continues to look bearish. FTSE is one back, back below um, 7,000. It briefly dipped below that 6805 level that I highlighted and talked about last week. It looks increasingly likely we're probably going to retest it um, over the course of the next few days. Similarly, if we look at the German DAX. We are still very much in the downtrend that we've been in over the course of the past few weeks. I am slightly encouraged by the fact that we are above the lows of October, but I still can't help feeling the direction of travel here suggests that we're going to get a return to these lows and potentially take them out. The big level, and I think the big driver, will be the S&P 500. I talked about this a little bit last week. That's three and a half thousand level. For the moment, we appear to be holding above it. It's also the 50% retracement 
of the entire up move from the 2020 lows to the 2022 highs. So that's going to be enormously important in the wider scheme of things. We'll get rid of that line there, and that will give us a fair idea of where we are at the moment. In terms of the rebound, I think to stabilize, we need to get above this series of peaks through here. So that level is around about 38.10, 38.07. If we can get a sustained break back towards the 50-day moving average and then push above it, then I think there is hope that we may have seen the bottom. But at the moment, I'm driven very much by the price action in terms of my mindset. And my mindset at the moment is very much sell into strength. Similar sort of story on the NASDAQ 100. We've managed to hold above the 61.8 FIB level of the entire up move from the lows back in 2020 to the highs earlier this year. But ultimately, these two levels, 10,500 on the NASDAQ 100, 3,500 on the S&P 500, they are, for me, potential lines in the sand when it comes to further um, uh, stock market losses. And at the moment, the outlook is not looking particularly positive. So what's going to stop markets from moving lower? Well, if the Fed shows any indication of a pivot, that doesn't look likely. We've got the likes of Neil Kashkari of the Minneapolis Fed talking about the prospects of much more aggressive rate hikes and that they've been, the Fed is prepared to over tighten doing too much rather than doing too little. And let's not forget, um, Neil Kashkari has generally tend to lean more towards the dovish side um, in some of his more historical utterances. So he tends to be perceived as a dove. The only person that at the moment I've heard talk about concerns that there may be a lag effect when it comes to monetary policy is Fed Governor Lael Brainerd, but she does appear to be in a minority at the moment. It'll be very interesting to see what the tone of the discussion is at the November meeting, but it certainly looks increasingly likely that we'll see 75 basis points from the Fed in November and markets are pricing another 75 basis points in December. We've got Euro dollar, um, increasingly strident calls from some ECB officials for a 75 basis point rate hike from the ECB when they meet on the 27th of October. Um, despite an acknowledgement that GDP is likely to fall quite sharply, these calls for a more aggressive tightening have continued to increase despite PPI at 46% in Germany and a headline rate of 9.9%, headline rate of 9.9% in the EU. We also have to remember that that headline rate is being held down by French CPI, which is around about 6.6%, largely because of the efforts of the Macron government in terms of imposing an energy price cap on the companies that sell electricities, electricity to consumers. Essentially, the French government is paying the difference when it comes to the energy price costs and yet no one's freaking about freaking out about the cost of French sovereign debt despite the fact they have a GDP debt to GDP ratio which is around about 15 to 20 points above where the the UK's is but I digress um, the line of least resistance for euro dollar continues to be sell the dip sell the rally um, resistance at the 50-day moving average in this downtrend line here it's finding a little bit of support at around about 96.20 but the low, the high, the rebounds are still fairly shallow. If we look at these, you've got lower highs. The big question will be is how the markets react when we see a return to this trend line here, which I've just drawn in um, on this daily chart here. So keep an eye on any test back towards this line, see whether or not we, we break below 96.20 because it's quite likely we could head lower. Same applies to the pound, really. That's looking really heavy in early trade this morning ran into a wall of selling around about 114, also the 50 day moving average. It does look as if we're probably gonna see a revisit of 109.20, which was the uh, lows back uh, on the 12th of October. And we could well see further weakness if UK gilt yields continue to edge higher. We've, I think, gone slightly beyond um, the, um, uh, we've slightly gone beyond the scope of higher rates will help to support the pound. I think probably the likelihood is that the reverse is now 
true. And that's really no better borne out by Euro sterling, where we continue to see fairly decent support in and around this trend line that I've drawn from the lows through here, but also the 100 day moving average. The next resistance is 88.60. Obviously, this was the mini budget. We've come back down since then, but we do appear to be heading back higher again while this uptrend line is intact. So looking ahead to the ECB, rates are heading higher. German 10-year yields are now nearly 2.5%. Italian 10-year yields are even higher than that. And at some point, there are going to be some serious questions asked about the, um, the level of yields in some of the weaker Eurozone countries, which is going to be a big test for the ECB when it comes to the TPI program, their transmission uh, protection uh, uh, medicine, if you like, um, when it comes to borrowing costs. We've got the Bank of Japan, we've got dollar yen, we're now above 150. The likelihood is that we're probably going to go back to go even higher towards 152.30. Talk of intervention. Ultimately, the Bank of Japan can talk about intervention until it's blue in the face. Until they alter their monetary policy settings, um, it's unlikely that the dollar yen will continue. To, will, will continue. You know, it'll, it's unlikely the dollar yen will dip that much. We'll probably head towards 152.30, towards 155, and towards 160. We will probably get some intervention at some point. The whole point of the intervention is not to prevent the yen weakness, it's just to slow it down. Um, we, we saw back in September that we got a bit of intervention, which was here. All it did was slow it down for a few days before we then carried on moving higher. And while US Treasury yields continue to widen away from JGBs, the likelihood is that we're going to see 155 and 160 over the course of the next few days and weeks. We've got the Bank of Canada as well, um, got a similar inflation problem to pretty much everybody else. We've seen some bumper hikes from the Bank of Canada. They haven't made any difference in terms of the strength or otherwise of the Canadian dollar. Continues to remain weak, not helped by the fact that the oil price um, continues to come under pressure and is probably likely to continue to do so irrespective of what OPEC plus continues to do with respect to production cuts. They'll probably cut again, but while Chinese demand remains weak and um, pressure on incomes remains weak, then the likelihood is the demand side of the equation is likely to pressure oil prices going forward. We've got US third quarter GDP and core PCE, not really going to place much importance to that. We've already seen two negative quarters for US GDP in Q1 and Q2. The only reason to see a rebound in Q3 is likely to be due to um, inventory rebuilding. Personal consumption, which showed growth of 2% in Q2, is expected to be much weaker in Q3. So you could have the perverse um, situation whereby you get slower personal consumption and that's likely to come in around about 0.8%, but you could actually see a really decent rebound in third quarter GDP of around 2%. But again, that will be inventory rebuilding as we head into the end of the year and a potential, a, a potential Christmas and Thanksgiving bump in consumer spending, which in the US has been slightly more resilient this year, but is certainly looking a lot weaker in Q3 than it was in Q2. So let's quickly have a look at the key numbers that I'm looking at next week. We've got Shell coming out, third quarter numbers. Seen big jump in revenues and profits this year. It's had its fair shares of problems when it comes to Russia. It's managed to, de it's managed to decouple a certain amount from that. Q2 saw another record quarter for the oil majors or the oil major. Um, Q3, probably looking at the oil price and the gas price. Gas prices are lower, oil prices are lower. I'll be surprised if we see a significant outperformance relative to Q2, but certainly I still think we'll see some fairly decent profits, and that's likely to renew further political calls for an increase in uh, windfall taxes on this particular sector. Um, it starts to get a bit boring after a while, these calls for windfall taxes. If you want to encourage companies like Shell to 
um, e extract North Sea gas assets, then I think you really need to start thinking a lot more carefully about calling for windfall taxes, because why would you as a company invest in the North Sea oil if you're going to see 70 or 75 percent of your taxes taken away as a consequence of that upfront investment? It just makes absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. Banking shares, NatWest, we've got coming out with their third quarter numbers. I've got a, got a fairly decent set of Q2 numbers. Since then, we've seen a little bit of a pullback, largely on the basis of obviously the weakness in the UK economy. Similarly, for Lloyd's as well, um, not altogether surprising. Most of the banks, NatWestern Lloyd's, make the bulk of their profits on the loan differentials um, between lending and um, what they take on deposits. And that's as probably as wide as it's ever been. But we also have to be aware that we could well see um, a significant increase in impairments on the back of rising mortgage rates. And I think that's something that we do need to be acutely aware of as we look at the numbers, particularly for Lloyd's and for NatWest. Operating costs also going to be higher, higher wages. Um, some, some NatWest branches are starting to be closed now at um, the high street level. So I think banks are looking to cut costs that way. Um, so that, that obviously needs to be a factor as well. But if we look at, say, for example, NatWest, we can see that every time the share price has got anywhere near 200p, we've seen a fairly decent rebound. So I don't expect that to change. It still remains very much a case of buy the dip for NatWest. Similarly, Lloyd's has been a bit of a head scratcher for me because Lloyd's has been probably more profitable now than it was two or three years ago. And yet the share price is at half the levels it was back in um, 2017 or even pre-pandemic 2019. Uh, yeah, it's really struggling to get much above 50p, though there is fairly solid support at 40p. And ultimately, it also pay, pays a fairly decent dividend. So at some point, um, this weakness in UK assets is likely to resolve itself all by itself. Barclays and HSBC, uh, investment banking business. HSBC is going to be particularly interesting, I think, in terms of its Asia business, given the weakness that we've seen in China. Um, how much of that weakness in China is going to affect HSBC's numbers? You can see the way the, the share price has performed over the course of the last few weeks with respect to HSBC. Uh, and we can see that it's found a little bit of a base around 440p, but around about 480p, it's finding a little bit of a resistance. So I think slow down in its Asia business, we could we could see a negative surprise for HSBC, given the fact that that's where HSBC makes the bulk of its profits. And obviously, we are also looking at big tech. I've just picked out Microsoft and Apple because um, I'm a little bit strapped for time. But we, do, we also have Amazon and um, uh, we have Alphabet as well. As we head, as we start to look, um, ahead, as well as Meta platforms, Facebook, and given the horrible snap numbers that we saw late on Thursday night, Meta platforms is certainly going to be an interesting one, given the fact it's had a real shocker of a year share price wise. When it comes to Microsoft, let's look at the Microsoft chart. We are in a very much a downtrend when it comes to the Microsoft share price, um, irrespective of how well. Um, that company has continued to perform. But one of the key notable things that I took away from its last earnings announcements, its, its Q4 earnings announcement, was that PCs and gaming revenue was starting to so was starting to show significant signs of stagnation and potentially a slowdown. Um, in its last quarter, we saw that PC and gaming revenue pretty much um, Came, came in slightly above the levels a year ago at $14.36 billion. And actually negative sales growth in Xbox and content of minus 6% and Windows OEM of minus 2% um, suggested that demand was slowing for these bigger ticket items. Microsoft saying says it expects to see first quarter revenues 
of between 49.2 and 50.2 billion dollars would still be 10 percent higher than a year ago but would be markedly down from what we saw at the end of last year so keep an eye on 220 that key support level um, through there for and the lows that we saw um, during october apple um, cut production of its iphone 14 um, we're in a nice triangular consolidation here seen a bit of a rebound over the course of the past few days but ultimately i think the fact that Apple's downgraded its iPhone production or cut back on its iPhone 14 production suggests either that they're not seeing the demand for the new iPhone or they're having production issues. Um, they also left the prices for the new iPhones unchanged, which also suggests that perhaps they are starting to become a little bit more price sensitive. And um, it'll be very interesting given the fact that Q1, the next quarter, tends to be the most profitable quarter um, whether or not markets start to price down the likelihood of a significant slowdown in iPhone and iPad sales as we head into the Thanksgiving and Christmas period. As a reminder, Apple haven't given any guidance for the last two or three years, so they're not likely to change that outlook, but it certainly does look as if the outlook for big tech is likely to become an awful lot more difficult over the course of the next few weeks so we've got a big next couple of weeks um they the the outcome of next week's central bank meetings and the week after are likely to, to be a key arbiter of where risk is likely to go to next but ultimately what i'm seeing and what i'm thinking is that it still remains very much a case of um sell the rally in stock markets until such times as we get a breakout of those downtrend lines that I've been talking about and highlighting in the videos of the, over the course of the past few weeks. Otherwise, that's it for this week. We've got a big week coming up, new prime minister, big central banks, big earnings. I hope you all have a great weekend and good luck trading next week.